Uh, Mark O'Neill has been busy since uh, 2006 writing books on Chinese history, eight of them since 2006. When we spoke last week about today's talk, he told me that as a non-Jew, he was somewhat nervous about writing this book, as Jewish scholars know the story well. So he consulted many of them along the way to avoid what he called Gentile errors. I don't think he made many. <laughs> uh, three of his books have religious themes. The first one about the Taiwan Buddhist uh, Tzu Chi Foundation. The second about his own grandfather, an Irish Presbyterian missionary in Manchuria, and this book. He told me that the most memorable interviews for this book were with four rabbis. Three belonged to the Chabad Lubavitch movement based in New York, an arm of Orthodox Judaism. Mark will share insights today from his new book, which is a history of the Jews in China and the dramatic relations between China and Israel from 1948 to the present. It includes coverage of Sir Victor Sassoon and Silas Hardun, who turned their fortunes from trading opium into a property empire that still dominates parts of Shanghai. He will show us photographs from the book on Jewish life in China over the past 150 years, and the book also includes a great deal about the Jewish people who have had a profound impact on China, including Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, and Henry Kissinger. The photo on the front cover of the book shows Chabad students who have just arrived in Shanghai in 1938, escaping the Holocaust in Europe. Although the two millennia when the Jews did not have a homeland, through the two millennia when the Jews did not have a homeland, it was the rabbis who were guardians of the faith. Mark learned much from the rabbis. He will talk to us now about that, his book, and the history of the Jews in China, and we will take questions afterward. Mark O'Neill. Thank you very much, uh, Jody. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me today. It's a wonderful platform to introduce our new book. Um, I must also thank very much the many Jewish friends who helped me write the book. Um, without them, as Judy said, I would have fallen into many Gentile errors. So um, I want to thank those professors uh, today. <clears throat> now, the book covers the history of the Jewish people in China and also the relations between Israel and China since 1948. And the theme of the book is summarized by this wonderful quote, which was given to me by Rabbi Osa, who is from the Ohel Leia Synagogue in Hong Kong. Simon, maybe you'd like to read it? <laughs> it's not right for me to read it. Someone else should read it. Uh, the story of the Jews in China is one of those lucky times we see God's guiding hand, we have seen providence. Rabbi Asher. Now, what he means by this is those of you who know Jewish history in Russia, in Europe, in the Middle East, in many countries, is of a wandering people full of suffering, persecution, difficulties, being forced to move from one country to another. Now. The, stories, the story of the Jews in China is quite the reverse. They have always been welcome in China. They didn't face any prejudice or discrimination. And uh, it's really remarkable in this uh, context. OK. So the Jews first arrived in China during the Tang Dynasty. At that time, China was the world's most prosperous country. So thousands of foreigners came to China to work uh, as merchants, and Jews were among them, and they lived in uh, Luoyang, Chang'an, in the centers of the, the, Tang, the Tang Dynasty. And the major settlement was a, town, a city called Kaifeng in Henan province. So I'm just showing you here a, we, we can't say a photograph, but a, a, a model of what the Kaifeng Synagogue was uh, at its largest size. The largest size, it was 10,000 square meters. Now this was a very large synagogue in Harbin, in northeast China. This is a former synagogue in Harbin, that was renovated in the last five years. So if you go to Harbin now, you can see it. I think many of you in this room know what this is. Anyone? That's right. This is the OLA synagogue in, in, in Hong Kong. This is the oldest one, the oldest standing synagogue in China. And I'm sure some of you know this gentleman. 
Anyone? Yes. So this is Rabbi Osa and his wife. And the rabbi was extremely helpful in the writing of this book. He gave me time for an interview. He showed me around the synagogue. And he introduced me to several members of his congregation. Now, what happened to the Jews in China is quite different to what happened to them in Europe, because they came to, to uh, Luoyang and Chang'an to do business, and they were very much welcomed by the Chinese government. They were given the same rights as Chinese citizens. They could take up any profession they wanted. They could buy land. They could join the government. And some of them uh, sat the imperial exam and became gov uh, government officials. And some of them went into business. But unfortunately, this has a bad side because, of course, the, they assimilated because it was too easy. So they would learn Chinese. They would wear uh, Chinese costumes. There was a shortage of women, of course, so they, many of them married Chinese ladies. So it was very hard in this circumstance to preserve the elements of Jewish culture. But from the human perspective or the Chinese perspective, it's something very admirable that they were assimilated in this way. So as time went on, the Jews in Kaifeng, they lost contact with the Jewish world uh, outside, and they became increasingly assimilated and sinicized. And then Kaifeng itself went into decline. There were serious floods and civil wars. The synagogue was destroyed. There was no new rabbi. So the view of the Chinese government today is that there are now no Jews in Kaifeng. There are no Chinese Jews. That's the view of the PRC government. Okay. However, these five ladies, they're from Kaifeng, and they've just done Aliyah. They've just emigrated to Israel. And there is 19 people from Kaifeng who have been accepted by the Israeli government, and they have moved to Israel. So there they are outside the wall of lamentations. So these five ladies at the moment are in a, a theological seminary, and they are learning Hebrew. They are learning um, Jewish scriptures and history. And when they've completed their studies, I think it's about three years, they will take an exam, and the rabbinical court in Israel will decide if they are qualified. And if they are, then they can become Jewish and become citizens of Israel. And there is 19 of these people from Kaifang who have gone. And as you can see, they look exactly like Han Chinese. Now, I have asked quite a lot of Jewish people about these so-called Kaifang Jews. And quite a few Jewish people are rather skeptical and say they have lost their Jewish uh, character. They didn't have a rabbi, they didn't have a synagogue, they didn't learn Hebrew. So they are a bit skeptical as to why the government accepted them. But in Israel, there are certain institutions which seek what they call the lost Jews around the world. And it's one of these groups, which is called Shiva Israel, which has brought these 19 to Israel. And it took them three years of lobbying in the government in Jerusalem to persuade them to allow these 19 to go. OK, so let's switch back in history now. And let's look at the two major Jewish communities in China before 1949. So these are photos from Harbin. So what happened in Harbin was the, the Qing dynasty and the Tsar agreed to build a railway across Heilongjiang to shorten the distance of the Trans-Siberian Railway. And the center of this railway was Harbin. And Harbin became a Russian city, but not in Russia. So thousands of Russians emigrated to Harbin to work on the railway initially and then to do a lot of other things. And there were many Jewish people among them. So this is a photograph of one of these Jewish families in, in Harbin with their servant. And they published many newspapers there. And they were mostly in Russian, because that was the language they used. And I'm sure some of you recognize the gentleman in this photograph. Yes? Yeah. The father of Zionism. Yeah. 
On the right side is the interior of one of the Harbin synagogues, and the left side is uh, Jewish merchants who are in the fur business. Uh, Manchuria, this was a very big business. So many Jewish people went into the business of buying furs and then processing, the, processing them into coats and clothing. This was the Jewish uh, uh, center for the aged and the ill in Harbin. So if you were an elderly person, you had no family to look after you, the community looked after you in this center. So the Jewish population of Harbin was 25,000 at its maximum, and they were involved in all parts of the economy, factories, trading firms, banks, hotels, and they had a very active social life, community life, synagogues, schools, hospitals, music academy, and they were quite different from the Jews of Kaifa in the sense that they kept their own community together. They didn't assimilate with the Chinese. There was no persecution of them, but they just kept, kept to themselves. Um, we call Harbin the Shanghai of the North. Uh, as you can see, there were 3,000 firms with foreign investment, 4,700 trading firms. It was an extraordinary economic boom that happened. And this was cut short by the Japanese invasion in September 1931. So this is a photograph from the uh, cemetery, Jewish cemetery in Harbin. Now, this isn't the original one. There were several cemeteries before, and they were damaged or destroyed uh, after 1949. And then the government of Harbin uh, set up a new site, moved many of the graves there, and this new site is now very well looked after, and that's what it looks like today. Um, on the right side is a, an advertisement for Hotel Modern which was the most upmarket and famous hotel in Harbin at the time. And we have a long section on that in the book. And there's a very tragic story that's attached to it. And on the left, I want to show you this photograph. The gentleman on the right is called Professor Ben Kanan. And he was one of these two Israeli professors who really created this book, because he gave me so much help, uh, not only with the chapter on Harbin, but with other chapters. He provided a lot of material himself. And he's the man behind the reconstruction of Jewish Harbin. It's all due to his dynamism that this has happened. So there he is uh, uh, working on the plans for rebuilding the Jewish synagogue and the music school. So now we move from uh, Harbin to Shanghai. And this is the Grosvenor House in Shanghai. Uh, any of you been there? This is a very famous building. It was an upmarket apartment block before 49, and it's an upmarket apartment block now. And President Nixon stayed there in 1972, and he signed one, his communique, Sino-American communique in this, in this uh, building. Can anyone tell me who this is? Yeah. Right, Jinjiang, right. And the gentleman in the middle? Sassoon. Yes, so this is Sir Victor Sassoon, who was the wealthiest Jew in Shanghai before, before 90, 1949. And I chose this picture because uh, uh, Sir Victor was very famous for his, how do I say it, his choice, choices. He didn't marry, he just kept himself a free, a free man. Yep. <laughs> yeah. And how about this, this man? This is probably the second richest Jew in Shanghai before 1949. His name is Silas Hardun. And the two men are quite similar in that they made a fortune from importing opium. And when opium became illegal, they used the, the money they'd made from opium to invest into property. So Grosvenor House was one of the buildings which Sassoon built. And Hardun uh, created uh, Nanjing East Road. He owned many of the properties on both sides. Um, there was a tramway, the first tramway along Nanjing East Road, and it became the, the commercial shopping center of Shanghai. And uh, many department stores were, were based there, and they paid rents to him. So he was an extremely wealthy man. And on the left is his wife. And he was a very unusual Jew in the sense he didn't marry another Jewish person. He married a Buddhist. She was a mixed race and a very devout Buddhist. 
So here's a photo of Nanjing East Road, and I would say Hardoon would most own most of the properties you're looking at. So the two men accounted for 60 to 70 percent of the opium trade until 1914. So with his money, Hardoon built the largest private housing, uh, private house in, 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 in Shanghai, and it had a very large Buddhist component because of his wife, and this is a, a portion of his very large house. He also gave money for a synagogue. So on the left side, this is the synagogue that was donated, built with money from Hardoon. And on the right is one of the most extraordinary pictures of this story. This is the Mir Yeshivar from Stephen Amar, Lithuania. And they managed to escape the Holocaust. They arrived in Shanghai. And they spent the war doing their studies in this same synagogue. Now, this was the largest synagogue in Shanghai at the time and it was built with money from Sir Victor Sassoon. So now we move on. Hitler has taken power in Germany, and the Jews are seeking a place to escape. So this is a ship arriving from Germany with Jewish people who are able to get out legally. I mean, they, they were able to buy a ticket, get on a boat, and come. Uh, so many came that uh, they had to have dormitories like this where they, they lived. Now, this is uh, from the cover of the book, and these are students of the Chabad Lubavitch group, uh, group, and they've just got off the ship in Shanghai, and it's 1938. And gradually, as the Nazi control of uh, Germany and Europe tightens, it's harder and harder for Jewish people to leave. The countries of the West largely close the door to them. And uh, Shanghai becomes a place of refuge. 25 to 30,000 Jewish refugees from Shanghai stay there during the war. And um, it's really, how can I say, miraculous what happened that they were not wanted in, in, in North America, in South America, in the UK, but they were able to come to China, which had no historical connection to them. And as you can see, some of them died of illnesses, um, hunger, and so on, but none of them were killed. 1942, the Gestapo representative in, um, in uh, Tokyo, Joseph Meisinger, comes to Shanghai and he tells the Japanese, now you must implement the final solution with all these Jewish people in, in Shanghai. And he gives them three ways to do it. But the Japanese refuse, so they are left alone during the war. So how is it they came from Germany, Austria, Lithuania, uh, Russia into China? H how could they get the necessary exit visas? So I want to show you the, the faces of three diplomats who helped them. This one is called He Feng Shan. He was the ROC consul in Vienna. He was ordered by his uh, senior in Berlin not to give any more visas to Jews, but he disobeyed the order and he just continued to hand them out. So this is one of the visas he handed out, and this is one of the uh, people who received his visa. This is the Japanese uh, consul in Kaunas in Lithuania, and it was the same. He was told by his ambassador not to give any more visas, but he continued to, to give them out. So here's a photo of them queuing outside his consulate, and that was his moment of enlightenment. He got up one morning at six o'clock, he opened the window, he opened the curtain, and this is what he saw, a huge line of Jewish people outside trying to get the visa. So he was so moved that he gave them many visas. So here he is being a diplomat, having a dinner with a Nazi official. Now those two are included in the uh, Yad, Vad Yashem uh, memorial in Jerusalem as the uh, righteous among the nations. That is, the Israeli government honors them as helping Jews escape during the war. 
Now, this gentleman is called Mr. Wang Ti Fu. He was a consul of the Manzhou Guo government in Beijing, in Berlin, and he also gave many Jew, Jews visas. But the problem with him is that he worked for what was a puppet government of the Japanese. So after the war, he returns to, to China. He is imprisoned by the Russians for more than 10 years. Then he's imprisoned by the communist Chinese for more than 10 years. He's a black person. So no one is able to do any research to interview the Jewish people he helped. So he's not in uh, Vad Yashem, and it's probably too late to, to learn about him. But just before he died, he, he gave many interviews to a, uh, a Chinese journalist, and she published the book about him. So my material on him comes from this book. So he, here are the, some of the visas he gave out. And this is a Japanese man who also helped the Jews very much during the war. His name is Kotsuji Setsuzo, and he's the second on the left there. And he was the only Japanese at that time who could speak and read Hebrew. He had a great empathy with the Jewish people, and he helped them greatly uh, in Japan, where there were various waves of anti-Semitism, but he battled against them. And he finally um, converted, and he went to, 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 to Jerusalem. He had circumcision in an Orthodox hospital, and he's buried in, in Jerusalem. Now, after at the end of World War II, uh, the situation in China greatly deteriorated. We have a civil war, inflation, um, then the communists take power. So there's no place for, not just for Jews, but for foreigners in China anymore. So um, nearly all the Chinese leave. Um, they go to the US, Canada, Australia, and Israel. And one of those who came out very early was our friend, Sir Victor Sassoon. And he started liquidating his assets even in the 1930s. So although he lost money, of course, he lost much less than many of his counterparts who waited. So he moved to Nassau in the Bahamas. And finally, in his 80s, he did get married. So this lady was his, his first and only wife. And she was his nurse. Okay. Um, this is the house of the Kaduri family in Shanghai. So that's how it used to look. This is how it looks today. And it's now a youth palace. The Kaduri family donated it to the government. Yeah, so Sassoon so was the fastest to get his money out. I mean, he saw the outcome of events ahead of other people. Now, the Republic of China always supported the aspiration of Jewish people for the reestablishment of Israel. It supported the Balfour Declaration very early, like Japan did. And as you can see, it uh, did not vote against the establishment of Israel at the UN. And it recognized Israel very early and voted to admit it into the United Nations. But then the RSC government retreated to Taiwan. And the new government, the PRC government, they are revolutionary and uh, they support Arab causes. So. Israel was willing to recognize the PRC, but not the other way around. Anybody tell me who this is? His name is Shaul Eisenberg. He was uh, a Polish Jew who was born in Munich. He escaped from Rotterdam by boat, and he spent the war in Shanghai and Japan. And he was the pioneer of trade between Israel and the PRC. So in 1979, he arranged the first Israeli military industrial delegation to go to Beijing. And the background to this is that in the war with Vietnam, China suffered very heavy losses. And the PLA realized how backward they were. They desperately needed new equipment, new technology. It couldn't buy it from the West. It couldn't buy it from the Soviet Union. So they turned to Israel. And Mr. Eisenberg was the key middleman. But this delegation had to be kept uh, completely secret. 
So they were put in a hotel near Beijing Airport and they were taken to the Friendship Store in 3 at 3 a.m. in the morning. It was specially open for them because no one was to see them. They weren't supposed to be there. And for a period, China became Israel's biggest arms market. Now this photo is taken at the National Day Parade in the ROC because Israel also sold uh, technolo arms technology to the ROC. So this missile, Xiongfeng, was made with Israeli technology. They sold them a wide range of military hardware. So finally, in January 1992, Israel and China finally normalized relations, and uh, it's taken a very long time. Now, in the last five years, there's been an astonishing um, romance between the two countries. China is on the road to becoming the biggest foreign investment investor in Israel. This is what was predicted by the Jerusalem Post in January. And it's mainly because China, Chinese companies and individuals have a huge surplus of capital. Uh, Israel is the startup nation. It has so many bright young entrepreneurs with good ideas, good products, but not enough money. So Chinese companies are investing in these startups. And I think you recognize the man second from the right. Mr. Li ka -Sing. Now, he was the earliest Chinese investor in Israel, and he invested in a company called WAZE, Waze, which is a traffic function in your car. And less than two years after he invested, it went public, and he made 143 million US dollars out of it. So what he did was he used 130 million of this, and he donated it to Technion, which is Israel's MIT. And Technion decided to build a joint venture institution at Shanto University. And this is the groundbreaking ceremony. And who's the gentleman in the middle with the white hair? I'm sure you recognize him. Perez, that's right, the, the former president of Israel. Um, he considered it sufficiently important that even at the age of 92, he came to attend this opening. So this new institute in Shanto University is a symbol of the cooperation between the PRC and Israel in the high-tech area. So this is the company that uh, Li ka made so much money out of. I'm sure some of you have it in your car. Now this is a big uh, desalination, sorry, it's the biggest desalination plant in, in Israel, which was also invested by a Li ka company. So now I just want to show you some Jews who have greatly influenced China, and I think uh, he has to be the, the leader. His grandfather was a rabbi, although himself he was not practicing. If you ask any mainland Chinese about who is a Jew, they will always mention Albert Einstein. Now who's this gentleman? Yeah, my father was one of his disciples. He was a psychiatrist, yeah. So I had to include this uh, photograph. Now, I think we can say without Kitchener, there would have been no normalization between the US and China. I mean, the US was very anti-communist at the time. The Republican Party was very anti-communist at the time, but without Kissinger making this secret visit, meeting Mao, and persuading Nixon of the benefits to the US, this normalization wouldn't have happened. And I want to put in this as the last photo. This is Professor Yitzhak Shicho of the Hebrew University. And he was the other Israeli professor who contributed so much to my book. So I wanted to put in his photograph to thank him publicly. OK, thank you very much. Ender has a question. Thanks, Jody. I'll kick it off. Um, Mark, you mentioned earlier, and it is intriguing, um, just in terms of the difficulties of working on this book when you're not a member of the community. And I wonder, could you explain to the audience um, how, how you managed to get the information together and how important was the cooperation? <coughs> well, I, I'm blessed to have many Jewish friends whom I've met during the course of my work, uh, my social life. 
So um, they were extremely helpful, and it was due to them that I was able to get access, for instance, to interview the four rabbis. They are very busy people. They have uh, many important duties to perform. Uh, but by asking them through their congregation members, I was able to get a meeting. So um, without the help of these Jewish friends, it would have been impossible to collect the material. Other questions? Yes, there's one here. Mark, can I just ask you, where do you think Israel fits into China's global ambitions? I mean, are they going to be participating in the Belt and Road? Do you see them as being used as a surrogate in some circumstances, maybe with the United States? I don't know what. Did you, did you pick up any of that? Well, let me tell you what Professor Shishaw says, and I, I think his answer is the best. He said, um, Israel is disappointed that there's no peace dividend. For whilst relations are very, uh, very close in the economic area, there's huge uh, Chinese investment in Israel, uh, this does not translate into China becoming an active participant in solving the Middle East uh, Palestinian issue. China sells many weapons to Israel's most bitter enemies, despite Israel asking it not to. Um, so Israel is disappointed that there is no diplomatic uh, involvement by China. But at the same time, Israel wants to diversify its bets. It doesn't want to bet only on the EU, only on, 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 on the US. So of course, it's delighted to have a, a member of the UN Security Council, a permanent member, involved in Israel and economically involved. and. Um, it's hoping this will lead to, to, to diplomatic and political help. And yes, certainly Israel is part of the One Belt, One Road. Its location is very important between Asia and Europe. And the Israeli uh, transport minister signed an MOU with a Chinese company to build a railway from Eilat to Ashdod. Now, that would be an extraordinary project to complete because that would enable you to ship your goods from Asia, and it would get off the boat in, in Eilat, and it would be taken by train to Ashdod, and then go all over Europe. But uh, this is a very difficult project to, to complete because of the geography of the area. But uh, uh, certainly, Israel wants to be closely involved in the One Belt and One Road initiative. Yeah. Other questions? Yes. So um, thinking about your information gathering on the Chinese side of the border, to what extent did you use official or unofficial archives, and how easy or not easy was it for you to access those uh, information sources? Well, in, in Shanghai, there is an uh, Institute of Jewish uh, Affairs uh, run by uh, a man called Professor Pang Guang, and he has written extensively on the Jews of China. So I use a lot of his material. His deputy is called Mr. Wang Jian, and uh, he's also written extensively, and I quote from them. And last, not last December, December before we went to Shanghai, I interviewed Mr. Wang Jian, and he was extremely informative and extremely friendly. But as you know, in the mainland, you, you can't say and write exactly what you want. There are parameters. So we were discussing World War II, and I said to him, Professor, did the Japanese save the Jews in World War II? Because from my Gentile perspective, they did save them. Because the Gestapo said, it, eliminate them, and they didn't. And the Jews, the, the Japanese were in charge of Shanghai during the war. But a Chinese professor cannot speak well of the Japanese, especially during the war. So he gave a long reply, about 20 minutes long, <laughs> all with good arguments but it was a way of avoiding saying that the Japanese saved the Jews but I mean his arguments were not without merit I put them all in the book so um, these two were very uh, helpful these two gentlemen and they've written a lot and they had a lot of knowledge and then the, there was also an excellent book about the Jews in Harbin by two Chinese scholars and this I've used extensively 
it was also very extremely helpful. Yeah. Other questions? Oh, well, I'll ask one. Um, so you had said that there was not uh, overt discrimination of the Jews um, uh, before the war in China. I, I find that somewhat surprising. Uh, and so you, can you talk a little bit about that? About Did you find that surprising? Well, the, the, the Jews came to Shanghai and Harbin right at the beginning. So when the foreign community grew in these two cities, the Jews were there right, right from the beginning. Now, in Harbin, there were anti-Semites among the white Russians who were there. There was some anti-Semitism among the, um, the Japanese military. But the Jews were well established in, in, in Harbin. They had their own institutions, their own businesses. Um, so after 1931, the situation deteriorated. The white Russians were able to get their voices heard. Um, uh, many Jews left Harbin because the conditions were deteriorating. But remember that China and Japan both offered the Jews a homeland. So whilst from Europe they're being driven out, the Japanese proposed a homeland for them in Manchuria, and Chinese offered them a homeland in Yunnan. So the official Japanese policy was pro-Japanese. So whilst individual officers were, I would say not so much anti-Semite, but greedy, they just wanted to get hold of Jewish assets, Jewish hotels, Jewish businesses. So while individuals were, and white Russians were certainly anti-Semite, but the government policy wasn't, wasn't so. So it's just, we have to compare it with what was going on in Europe. So uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's just like Rabbi Osa said, it was a, we see the hand of God at work there. Any last question? If not, we'd, I'd like to thank Mark O'Neill for a very interesting talk. And he has some books here, if anyone's interested afterwards. Thank you all for coming.